coming from, right? So as you heard me talk about at the beginning, we're talking about that big element in the bottom is your baking element. That's the most powerful element. So the first thing we have to be aware of is that when we're engaging that baking element, right, to any degree in the cooking process, we have to be very aware of how much energy is coming from below because then if you put something delicate in the bottom, cookies, biscuits, brownies, something that could really, really be burnt or scorched or baked too quickly, over browning, all that kind of stuff. We want to be aware of that as we're down in the bottom of the ovens. We want to be cognizant of that rack position again, right? The rack position one, two, or three, right? In that lower half to third of the oven. Right? We want to be just kind of really aware of that. Um, so we don't want to put something down in rack position one if we're going to just, if we're afraid it might burn, right? Because if a lot of that energy is coming from down below, that's definitely going to happen, all right? So that bake mode, right? That very simple, right? The mode that everybody says, oh, bake 350, I got it, right? So even at 350 degrees, if you put something delicate in rack position one, you're likely to burn it. And that's because in the bake mode in our ovens, both E and M series, 90% of that 350 degrees is being generated from down here. Only 10% comes from the top. So when you think about bake mode, let's think about it as this gentle sort of lifting sort of energy of heat. Because when we think about when we're baking, we're, we're really baking. We're having a cake or maybe we're baking some biscuits or something like that where we want them to rise gently, right? We want them to rise too fast and over brown on the bottom. We want them to rise nice and gently and get a nice golden brown finish on the top. So by having 90% of our energy from below, it's literally like it's something that's pushing up those baking items um, as we're going to make sure this one stop beeping. Um, but anyway, so that's where the bake element, right? That element is kind of gently lifting things up, but we don't want to put anything too close. So generally speaking, unless my item is very dense, like a, a fruit pie or a lasagna or something like that, we really don't want to use racks positions one or two when we're just baking a single tray of something because it's going to be easy to burn something because 90% from here, 10% from the top to just give that gentle browning. So again, bake is just that. It is really designed for baking. I'm not saying that you can't cook some chicken breasts in the bake mode. However, there are modes that are more appropriate for doing that and it'll give you a better result. That's the really important thing is you're gonna get a better result using a different mode, even though bake mode will cook your chicken breast just fine without any trouble whatsoever. But that's what bake is really designed for. Single plain baking, right? One rack. That doesn't mean you can't put two cake pans on one rack or two banana bread on one rack. But what it really is designed for is baking on a single plane, right? That's what we have to be very aware of when we're talking about bake mode, right? It's gentle and lifting, right? So some of the other still modes that we have in the oven. The other still mode that is probably going to be most uh, known to folks is the roast mode. So what's happening in roast mode and how does that differ from bake mode and why do we need a roast mode? Well, roast mode is what I like to kind of character characterize as sort of making your oven into a slow cooking, um, almost simmering environment. 75% of your energy in your oven in roast mode is coming from that element below the floor, but 25% is coming from the broiler element. So when you think about simmering something on the stove, whether it's you know a pot of stew or soup or something you wanna cook gently on the stove, right? Without burning the bottom, without scorching it, right? So think of that creating that environment in your oven if you're doing something that's going to simmer and cook for a long period of time. Something where you're more concerned in the outcome as what's the texture on the inside? Is it sliceable? Is it shreddable? Is it moist? Is it juicy? All of those things, right? We're not really concerned about making it exactly a medium rare or medium or even medium well. What we're really concerned about is getting it moist, getting it cooked perfectly. And so when we think about items like that, it's things like pot roast or braising lamb shanks or maybe we're braising some chicken thighs, or we're making a pulled pork, something that's gonna cook in the oven for a long time. We sort of wanna simmer it with some liquid, but we like that browning on top to give it color, right? And give it a little more caramelization where the flavor lives, right? So we want that extra heat coming from the top. So 
25% from the top gives us that browning, but we've got that simmer effect from below. So no restrictions on where you put things in the oven when we're in roast mode, put it down low, that's just fine. Because generally speaking, when you're gonna be cooking in roast mode, you're also gonna be having a little bit of liquid in that pan, so it'll cook really, really gently and slowly something that's gonna be in the oven for a long time. This is also a great mode for slow cooking a vegetable that you don't really, are, you don't really want it to come out beautifully crispy and caramelized and golden brown, but you really want it to be tender and soft. Maybe you're making a puree, maybe you're making a soup, maybe you're making some sort of, you know, some, something that you're going to can or something like that, but you really wanna get it cooked. Roast mode is gonna be that gentle way of cooking. So again, like the bake mode, we're talking about a gentle way of cooking something, something that's gonna be in the oven for a little bit of time. And we wanna encourage that development, not only of flavor, but of a really soft and, and, and moist texture. So roast mode, again, is ideal for that, right? And again, neither one of those are using the fan, okay? So those are the two kind of basic still modes. There is another still mode, which is pretty, um, familiar to everybody, which is the broil mode, right? Now, both ovens are going to be the same in the, the standard broil mode, the advantage or the difference between your E series and your M series that the M, the E series actually has a convection broil mode when we want to add the fans to the broiler, whereas the M series does not have that convection broil. So there's a slight difference between the two ovens there, but when we talk about broil, obviously it's 100% of the energy is coming from that broiler um, element on the top of the oven, right? Now, instead of setting a temperature when you're using the broiler, you're going to set it in a positions of, um, they're going to be just three numbers, one, two, or three. Um, the, uh, it's always going to default to the highest temperature, which is going to be three. And then if you want to move down a step, um, you can go to two and then the coolest step is going to be one, right? So when would you use the, the high temperature is in most cases when you're broiling, um, when you're cooking something thin, whether it's a, a, an inch thick or thinner, you're going to probably use that high temperature um, in order to get a nice caramelization on the outside while still cooking it through. Um, so three is going to be the, the best way. So if you're cooking something that's going to cook very quickly, like a fish filet or even like a chicken cutlet, you're probably going to want to use three. Once you get into a thicker cut, you may want to drop that temperature down a little bit so it doesn't over brown on the outside too quickly while still cooking through, right? Um, so in that broil mode, this without the convection fans, again, something really thin, you're going to want to cook on that very high temperature, or if you're wanting to just brown and melt cheese or brown the top of a casserole, you may just want to use that highest temperature. But when you want to cook something through, it's a good idea to lower the temperature or lower the rack position in order to facilitate not burning the item, but just browning it very, very gently. Now, remember with all broiler um, operations, you do not need to leave your door set a jar, it can be completely closed during the entire operation. Um, that's new for some people, but for most people who have, um, uh, you know, have used a Wolf appliance before, you'll, you'll know that that's true. You don't need to keep the door set a jar while you're broiling, okay? Um, I generally like to position my rack, um, not in the highest position unless I'm doing a very quick browning on something, um, but usually at one rack position, below the top one. So in, in either case, that's going to be rack position number five. Um, it's going to be the ideal spot for doing that broiler. Um, broiling, you're also going to get a broiler pan um, that comes with your oven. It's um, blue and it has a wire rack that fits in it. Generally, what I like to do is put um, some foil underneath um, my rack so it's easier to clean up. Um, and then you can just broil right on that rack um, to do that with there. So again, the broiler setting is also the only setting right? Um, in the still mode, or excuse me, it's the only setting where you cannot use your probe um, because that's, it just won't function. It's also uh, the intensity of the broiler and the proximity of the, the broiler um, element to the, um, to, the, to the probe insert um, could also cause this to melt. So you don't want to use the probe when you're broiling. Um, probably just want to get a good instant read thermometer if you're wanting to make sure that you're cooking something to a proper temperature inside, you can always just slide that out, use your instant read here, make sure you've got your temperature correct for the internal temperature. And then if you need to slide it 
back in and do some more broiling. So no probe when you're using the broiler element, right? So let's just speak really quickly about convection broil when we're talking about that in our E-series oven. When would you use convection broil? Um, convection broil just adds a cooking assist to whatever it is you want to broil. So in other words, if you have a very thick piece of steak or some chops or something that you really wanna make sure are cooked through um, throughout, um, you may wanna add the broiler, the convection element to your broiling um, feature. That'll give you a chance to cook the interior of that item while the outside browns properly during the cooking process. The, the convection feature just makes the oven a little more um, uh, efficient in terms of cooking something through. So when you're gonna use convection broils, when you have a th something thicker than an inch um, and you wanna cook it through while still broiling it, you're gonna add the convection feature during the cooking process in your E-series oven. So that's really the, one of the only mode differences between the two series is that you add the convection broil setting on your E, but not on the M series, okay? So that's when we talk a little bit about broiling um, and that's broil again as a still mode. Um, one of the really interesting modes that comes on both is the stone mode. Now the stone mode requires an accessory, which is some form of a bake stone, which is a ceramic slab of stone that goes into your oven, is the preheated with the oven in that mode um, so that you can bake pizzas or bread or other good, you can bake pita bread, you can do all sorts of fun things on your stone mode. The stone mode is very uniquely designed for the wolf ovens because of the configuration of our ovens with the four different elements in the oven, we can engineer the oven so that the stone is superheated so that it is the most efficient way to bake on the stone. Now the stone is always placed on the rack in the bottom most part of the oven in rack position one. It is positioned in that in the oven prior to preheating. You want to put it into a cold oven. What I always recommend as well is if you're using the stone, remove the other racks from the oven. Not that it affects the way the stone performs, but it's just easier to get the food in and out and off of the stone if you don't have the other racks to contend with when you're taking it out. Now in stone mode, the oven is providing 60% of the energy through the baking element and 40% from the broiling element. So what that does is it superheats that stone so that as we're baking our pizza on the stone, we're gonna get a beautiful, crispy, golden brown crust while just gently melting the toppings on our pizza and giving us a really ideal environment for cooking a pizza. Now that doesn't mean you can't cook other things on it, but it really is suited for using, um, for baking pizza, all right? So that accessory kit, if you don't own a stone already, you can always come and see us here at the showroom or you can order it um, through the Sub-Zero website as well, but you can come and get one of those stones. That stone kit not only includes the stone, but a particular rack for your oven model and also a peel for removing pizza or bread from the stone during the baking process. Lynn, question? If someone's using a baking steel instead of a stone, uh -huh. can they still use the stone mode? They should still use the stone mode and just make sure that your baking steel is placed in that lower, the lowest most rack position and again preheat it with the oven don't put it into a hot oven put it into a cold oven and let it heat up ideally remember um, with the stone mode um, you're going to find that that bottom is going to be the, the way you gauge the doneness of the food so always making sure you're peeking under don't just look at the top make sure you're looking at the bottom of the, the pizza or the bread that you're baking on the stone so that it cooks um, fully and gives you the, the crust that you really want remember also that each one of these different modes has its own predetermined preset temperature when you turn the oven on. So bake may be 350, roast may be 325. The stone mode is 400 degrees. This is a personal thing. I think that's way too cold for baking pizza. So I generally recommend that if you like your pizza a little bit crispier and brown around the edges, crank that temperature up, um, 475, 500, 525, even 550 should you be so bold, but I do like my pizzas that way. So I always like to preheat my, my stone um, on the highest temperature possible in, in order to um, get the, the, the effects that I would like. However, I would recommend if you're gonna bake a loaf of bread on your stone, lower the temperature, otherwise you're gonna get a really charred 
um, bottom of your bread. So again, stone mode, entirely designed for using that accessory only. You're never gonna use the stone mode for doing something else in the oven. It's really not conducive to it, right? That 60%, 40% split is very unique, but it's really designed for just getting that stone superheated. So again, stone mode, again, use it in conjunction with a bake stone only, right? Um, the other um, still mode is um, found um, as the proof mode. Now, yes, question. Sure, absolutely. Uh huh. We can certainly talk about um, baking at altitude here in Colorado. Obviously, uh, it's a uh, top of mind for so many people. Um, so, proof mode, right, is engaged um, in um, on your M series oven in the more button. You'll find in the more button. However, you access it, you'll find proof on your E series. It's just one of the. Um, it's right here on the uh, on the dial. You just touch proof. What is proof mode? It gives you a very, very low temperature environment for allowing your breads to prove and rise um, in, a, in a very controlled environment. Um, you're able to set the temperature as low as 85 degrees and up to 110. And it will hold that amount of temperature indefinitely so that if you need to prove hold something on. slowly, maybe it's a few hours, you wanna give it a nice Let's slow rise so the fermentation process is slower and more complete. You can use proof mode at that low set temperature setting. Again, a little bit of heat from the bottom, but no worries. You use any part of the oven to do your proof mode. Um, and again, it'll be very, very consistent. So those are all your still modes. Again, quick review, bake, roast, stone mode are all still modes. Um, broil is a still mode as well in both ovens. We had this and then proof is a still mode as well. Okay. Any questions out there and out there about that? No, no. So if you're baking bread, can you still use a stone or steel while using a water pan for humidity? You can. Um, it will, it shouldn't be too much of a problem. I've never tried it, but the only difference will be how deep the pan will be on the bottom of the oven. So you may have to put a very thin pan. If you have your stone in rack position one, you don't have a lot of space underneath. Um, and I would also recommend that if you are using a little bit of water for humidity in your oven while using the stone mode, um, just be uh, cognizant that you don't want to um, let, uh, don't increase the oven temperature too high because again, um, anything that's sitting on the floor of the oven at a too high a temperature could slightly discolor or um, you know, kind of uh, mar the surface finish. It won't damage the oven but it could mar the surface finish a little bit due to the fact that the baking element is on and that a pan sitting right on it could create a little bit of discoloration on the floor of your oven. So that's just me, but yes, you can. It'll just have to be a very shallow pan um, in order to do that, okay? All right, so let's talk about convection. First, we're gonna say talk about convection as just as concept, right? because it's very important to understand why convection and what convection was really designed for. And because there's a lot of stuff out there about convection that people might hear and they want them to kind of be clear, when do I use it? When should I use it? When should I not use it? That's really important. So let's first talk about what convection was originally designed to do. Convection was originally designed to do was to even the oven cavity so that if I'm baking in rack position one or rack position six, I'm gonna get the same results. I'm gonna get the same results on the back of my tray versus the front of my tray and the side to side. I wanna get a completely even bake, right? When we're really talking about convection, we're talking about baking because that's where we can notice the greatest amount of variation due to inconsistencies in the way heat is transferred inside the oven. So when we're talking about convection, we're almost always talking primarily about multi-plane baking, right? Or a very particular type of roasting, which will be accentuated through the use of convection. So when we talk about convection, right? And we talk about um, when to use it, we almost always, 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 always are gonna use convection when we're baking on multiple racks, whether it's two or three or even four, if you have enough racks, you can use convection to do that because it's going to even that oven cavity out completely. So 
That's when we start to talk about convection is when we're gonna bake on multiple planes. That's very, very important, all right? So how does Wolf's ovens facilitate that? How do we improve on the convection um, pro uh, pro process? Well, first and foremost, we have two fans as opposed to many other brands which only have one. Two is always going to be better than one because we can create a more consistent and very, I mean, consistent and varied sounds like we're talking, we're kind of contradicting ourselves, but what we can really do is we can make the air movement always, right? So consistently changing, right? So that we are creating a very low, low, low chance for hot or cold spots inside the oven cavity. Because with two fans, I can change the way the air is directed inside the oven by turning one fan off while engaging the other and then switching that and then running them simultaneously and then changing them again. So as it's constantly changing the way the air patterns are moving inside the oven cavity, I lower the chance for hot or cold spots and that for, therefore I have a, a very, very even oven cavity. Right? So the different convection modes in your oven right, allow you to do different things with the fans. So the first mode we want to talk about is just straight convection. And you're going to find that on both of your ovens, you're going to have straight convection systems. Convection system is 100%, 100% of the energy is coming from the, those two elements that surround the fans in the back of the oven. So there's no heat being produced from the floor and none from the ceiling either. So in other words, now we can use rack position one and rack position six simultaneously without worried about over browning on the top or scorching on the bottom because all that heat is coming from the back of the oven, swirling through the oven cavity in this special convection program that we have so that we're creating a very even baking cavity, right? Let's talk about convection really as a baking mode. Just like bake is a single plane baking mode, convection is a multi-plane baking mode, right? So if I have three trays of chocolate chip cookies or four trays of biscuits or whatever it might be, I want to use convection mode when I go into that, into that process, right? Now you can see with, with racks one, three, and five, this is a really ideal way for doing three trays because it's very evenly spaced. However, I could go, you know, I could move it down um, and do, you know, one, two, three, five, or one, three, four, five. I could do, you know, different Mode, uh, different numbers of racks in there, but it's all gonna give you the same effect. Again, with convection, that's what we're thinking about. We're thinking about multi-plane baking. We're always gonna use convection, okay? Always. Um, now, some of the things you probably heard about convection, a lot of people tell you, okay, lower your baking temperature or and or decrease the baking time, right? I'm a big proponent, especially here in Colorado, of keeping my temperature at a higher setting. So in other words, if my recipe was developed in Savannah, Georgia, and I brought it here to Colorado, and when I was in Savannah, I was baking at 350 degrees, whether it was convection or not convection, I like to keep my temperature the same because it's a variable that I don't have to worry about, right? In terms of adjusting for altitude, right? So, and, and or convection. So when I'm using convection, and I'm using a recipe, I always use the recipe that it was developed, the temperature that the recipe was developed with. I don't change it, I don't lower the temperature. But what I will do invariably when I'm using a convection process in my oven and I'm baking, I'm always going to check my baked goods early. Because the oven is more efficient in convection mode, I always wanna make sure that I'm checking them a little bit early, right? Always, always, always check it early because as the oven is, 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 is swirling that heat and cook and baking those items quickly, we want to make sure that we're not over baking it. Um, so I always like to check it a little bit early, probably 25%. So a 12, a 15 minute bake time, I'm probably checking that somewhere between 10 and 12 minutes just to make sure that it's progressing the way I'd like it to, right? And maybe I can pull it early. So you're going to save a little bit of time there um, as you're baking with convection. So again, convection is a baking mode for multiple planes, right? Sure, you can throw one tray in there with convection, right? But all it's gonna do is maybe cook it a little faster, might brown it a little bit more, but it's not really going to make it a better process. You could easily just use bake mode for that single tray and get very similar results in about the same amount of time. So 
you don't need to use convection for a single tray. So that's just plain convection. So whenever you're doing multiple trays of baking, you're gonna use convection. Now on your E-series oven, we have a mode called convection bake, right? Little bit different than just straight convection. You don't get convection bake on your M, but you do get it on the E. Convection bake is a 90-10 split, but it's 90% of the energy are coming from those elements around the fans, and 10% are coming from the baking element in the bottom of the oven. What's that gonna be good for? It's really gonna be good for multi-plane baking, right? A denser item, something that's a little thicker, a little heavier, needs some longer period of time in the oven to get it cooked all the way through. Examples of this are good are pie, heavy duty quick breads or dense breads that might need a little extra oomph from underneath. That's when you're gonna use convection bake. Yes, Lynn? Convection bake in the steam oven the same as it is in the E-series oven? Convection bake in the steam oven, the same. no, they are different. Because in convection bake in the steam oven, you are gonna be employing steam. It's the only place, obviously, that the oven where it can make its own steam. So that would be the, the, the biggest difference between those two. So again, convection bake in your E-series oven is really designed for something that's gonna be in the oven for a little bit longer period of time, needs a little bit of extra energy. So you can use multiple planes, um, in your oven, in convection bake, getting a little extra um, uh, push from below um, and give you that, that longer baking time. Um, so things that need to bake a little longer that are heavier, denser, like multiple lasagnas, things like that, where you need that extra energy. It's one of the reasons I think we didn't put it in the M series because it was really the mode that was used least frequently, right? So that 10% of energy that's coming from the baking element it's pretty negligible when you think about um, the impact that it's gonna have um, on the baking mode. So convection is gonna be your best bet for multi-plane baking almost every single time, all right? So the last really important convection mode is convection roast, right? Now convection roast is going to be the mode where you use the probe the most often. This is going to be the oven, this is gonna be that mode where you're really concerned about two primary things. First and foremost is, how beautiful is it gonna look, right? Is my Thanksgiving Day turkey gonna be magazine cover worthy? Is it gonna be golden brown all the way around and crispy skin and all those things? But obviously the other thing you're really concerned about with your Thanksgiving Day turkey is not undercooking it or overcooking it, right? You wanna get that temperature perfect. So that's where the probe is going to come in because that's gonna give you that result, right? So. Convection roast is when you're concerned about those two things. When we're in convection roast, right, 75% of that energy in the oven is coming from those rear elements around the fans. The other 25% is coming from your broiler element. No heat being generated by the bake element below because what we're really trying to do is swirl that heat all around the oven cavity so we're cooking something evenly, right, and giving that color a chance to even itself out through over the entire surface of whatever it is we're cooking. And that extra 25% of energy from the broiler is giving us that browning effect. So we're using the probe. So for most instances, you're gonna use the probe, you're gonna always insert, and when we set to convection roast here, right, we can then set our temperature. There but we wanna set our probe temperature as well. So we're gonna to touch the probe button. And now you can scroll on this particular model to set your probe temperature, right? In this case, if we were gonna do, let's say we were going to do a turkey. So we might set it to 158. So the reason we would um, set that probe temperature there is that as, the, as it cooks, the probe temperature reads out right next to what it is you're cooking, right? So it has your oven temperature. In this case, it was 355, completely random, just so you know, don't, don't, don't write that down. Um, and then our probe temperature at 155 for inserting the probe into the, to the bird as we're cooking it. And this is in a, 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 a mode, but anytime you just insert it in, Right, it's always um, my advice when you're inserting into poultry, 
hopefully you can use your imagination, but if this hand is the, uh, is, a, is a turkey breast and this is the wing, so this is the base of the breast right here at the bottom of the turkey, I always insert my probe from the top going into that thick part of the bird down near the base of the wing, right? Because if you can cook your turkey to 155 degrees there, I guarantee you that your legs and thighs will be cooked beautifully, still moist, but fully cooked, no blood in the joints, really nicely cooked. This is a great way to temperature uh, check your poultry um, because it's so difficult for many folks to insert this probe into a thigh um, or the leg and you push it all the way through and it ends up somewhere reading an air temperature as opposed to an actual temperature of the, the bird itself. So it's always a good idea when you're doing a bird is to insert downward into the thick part of the breast. I'll turn that off so it stops beeping. All right, so again, your probe is gonna be used almost entirely, um, every, almost every time you do convection roast mode. Because again, swirling air from the fans are giving you the most complete exterior finish and color and caramelization, while the probe is ensuring that you cook the middle to the exact temperature that you would like, all right? So on either model, that's going to be the way to do it, is to use your probe to guarantee those two results are gonna come out best. This is really designed as a mode for those nicer cuts of meat, a whole a roasting a turkey or a whole chicken. Maybe you're doing a prime rib or a beef tenderloin or a pork loin or leg of lamb. All of those things, you're very cognizant of how is it cooked inside? Is it medium rare? Is it medium? Whatever you want, you're gonna wanna use convection roast because it's gonna give you the best possible results for doing that. It's also gonna be the most efficient way to cook it because with that convection heat coming around it, it's gonna accelerate the cooking process. In fact, I was just reading an article, um, one of our chefs down in uh, Sub-Zero in the Carolinas cooked a 20 pound turkey from start to finish in two hours and two minutes using the convection roast mode in his M-series oven. So they do improve and speed up the cooking time really, really well um, as you're using the convection roast. So again, convection roast for those nicer cuts of meat, it's also the ideal mode for roasting potatoes, vegetables, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, you name it. When you want those vegetables to have a nice, crispy, you know, uh, browned exterior, this is the mode to use for doing those roasted vegetables, right? Even if it's just one tray, right? Now the convection is gonna improve the outcome because of the nature of the air moving across it. So convection roast, ideal for those modes for those, um, those roasting of vegetables, right? Really, really works well. And if you wanna jumpstart your vegetables even more, put the tray you're gonna roast the vegetables in the oven when you preheat the oven and put the vegetables onto a hot preheated tray and it'll cook them even faster and still give you a beautiful outcome with convection roast. Yes, Lynn. When baking a pie, some recipes will call to like reduce the temp after 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Should you ignore those or just cook it on like, High mode or in an M series oven, all right. So, to those of you out there who own an M series, you are at a, a true advantage in the sense that you have what we call the gourmet mode, all right. And to answer this question, I'm going to use the gourmet mode as an example. Um, gourmet mode is accessed here on this case in the dial, and instead of in gourmet mode in your M series oven, it allows you to choose the type of food you wanna cook, the process you would like to undertake, right? So in this case with baked goods, we choose that and we can go to pie and this is a great way to look at that. So if we look at a double crusted pie in the bake mode, right? Or in the, in the gourmet mode in our um, M series is it tells you how we're gonna cook it. So you're gonna preheat the oven first, it's gonna tell you, make sure the oven is preheated, right? And then you're gonna tell you exactly how the oven is gonna behave. It's gonna start your pie in the convection mode, so fans running, right, for 15 minutes at 425 degrees. It's then going to automatically change the mode. It's gonna switch into bake mode. So now instead of all the heat coming from those two um, elements and fans in the back, now the heat is 90% from the bottom and 10% from the top and it's gonna bake your pie until it's done at 350 degrees. So it's lowered it 75 degrees and it's changed the source of heat in the oven automatically. So yes, 
if you are doing this, right? If you have an E series oven, right? Right. You want to replicate that. That's easy to do. You just come in here and you start your pie at 425 in convection mode, let it go for about 20 minutes and then switch to bake mode 350 and finish cooking it to replicate what the gourmet does automatically. Right? So yes, if you're going to bake a pie in here, right, I would recommend not using convection mode the entire time, particularly if it has a double crust, because it will overbrown the crust on top, right, before the bottom crust and the filling have a chance to cook all the way through. So you get soggy crust on the bottom and slightly gelatinous, gloopy filling that may not be the way you want it to go. But the gourmet mode in your M series ovens um, give you that automatic feature that you can just bake a pie in that mode, but you can easily convert that over um, into an E-series oven as well. So, and that is really the other fundamental difference between these two oven models is that the M-series comes with the gourmet feature, the E-series does not, but the E-series also has convection bake and it has convection broil, which the M-series does not. So there are some slight advantages to both, right? Depending on how you like to cook and how much you'd like to have the oven do the cooking for you. So, um, so again, that's um, a kind of a review of the mode. The last convection mode is the dehydration mode, right? And in dehydration mode, um, very different. Um, the only really difference, um, other than just the fact that the temperature is more regulated between 135 and 185 degrees, is that in dehydration mode, the fan never turns off, right? It's for use with the Wolf dehydration kit, which is a set of racks that have a very fine weave of metal on them and also a small stopper that will actually prop your door open, right? So that it will allow as much humidity and moisture to be vented from the oven as possible. So that if you are, um, you like to make your own beef jerky, you like to dry your own vegetables, maybe you like to do meringue cookies um, during the holidays, you like to do a lot of things like that. The dehydration mode is ideal for that because it will slowly dry out um, and give you the perfect texture um, of, of whatever it is you want to dry. So if you're making your own jerkies or drying vegetables or anything like that, it's going to do that for you. And in dehydration mode, again, unlike the other fan, other convection modes, when you open the oven door in convection mode, the fans turn off. In dehydration mode, that won't happen. The fans will just keep right on blowing out hot air um, in order to, to do that dehydrating of the product. So that's your other, um, your last of the, of the, the fan modes is the dehydration mode right there. So um, that's kind of a quick review of all those different modes in the oven. Again, um, if, if there's any other questions about that, please shoot them towards me. I'm gonna talk a little bit about cleaning and maintenance of the oven, because this is really important. Um, you may hear this a lot. Um, there's a lot of sort of uh, stuff that flies around on the internet and in the world today um, about using the cleaning mode in your oven. Really, really straightforward. Um, you can use your cleaning mode. You just don't want to abuse your cleaning mode. What we like to recommend here is five times a year, run the cleaning cycle should you need to, right? So I joke four times a year and the weekend after Thanksgiving. I mean, that makes the most sense, right? That's going to give you a nice clean oven, right? Always remember that when we are going to run the cleaning cycle in the oven, we want to make sure all the racks are removed. That includes the racks on the sides. Those are easily removed. They're just on little keyholes. You don't need a screwdriver or anything like that. Just lift them up and, and take them out. And then you can reinsert them the same way. They only go in one way. So if you're not getting it right the first time, you probably have one on the wrong side and you have to switch it back over, but you can just put it back in. All those need to come out, right? Before you run the cleaning cycle. Um, on your M series oven, the cleaning cycle is a four hour cycle, right? So you wanna make sure that uh, you're prepared to give it that amount of time. On your E series oven, you have a choice between a three or four hour cycle, depending on how dirty the oven cavity is. Now, I do not recommend that you use the cleaning cycle for small stains or spills on the bottom of the oven. It really isn't worth it. I'm gonna show you a product that you can easily spot clean your oven with, so that should you need to take up a small stain in it, you won't have to go through the whole hassle of running your cleaning cycle. Um, but only use it when you really feel it is entirely necessary where you've got grease built up on all the walls 
in on the sidewalls, that's when you really want to run it, right? As long as you're only running the cleaning cycle four times, five times a year at the maximum, there really will be no risk of damage to the circuitry in your oven, right? There is a fan that will run behind the panel on all ovens to keep the circuitry cool during the cleaning cycle. And the oven does have an automatic shutout should it overheat for any reason, like you decided to clean your oven on the hottest day of July, right? It might run the risk of overheating some of the componentry. It will turn itself off in order to protect itself. So know that that is built in there. But again, just don't abuse the cleaning cycle and you'll have no trouble maintaining the ovens. Second, um, one of the other questions that I get probably more than anything else is, how do you clean that interior glass on the inside of your oven door? So really simple. If the oven is still warm, and I don't mean hot, I mean warm, um, let it cool, right, until it's just warm, open the oven door, and then use either one of these two cleansers, either the barkeeper's friend or the Bon Ami cleanser. Sprinkle a small amount of the cleanser actually right onto the glass. Use a blue Scotch-Brite pad to just make a paste with all of that cleanser. If you have stuff that's really baked on, a flat paint scraping razor blade, right, flush against the glass will help scrape off anything without scratching the finish. Then once you've done that with both the, 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 uh, the pad and the razor blade, wipe it down with a towel, um, a clean, uh, fresh uh, water, you know, some a clean uh, damp towel. And then I like to always finish it with some non-ammoniated uh, glass cleaner. Just spray it on there with a paper towel and wipe it down to shine it up. That really is going to keep your oven door looking really, really nice um, over time. It will, you know, you'll get a little bit of iridescence, but that's common with all tempered glass. It's going to get a slight iridescent to it, but that's going to be the best way to keep it clean. All right. Lynn, do you have a question? No. Yeah, yes. I'll save that are coming through. Okay. Sure. Great. So here's the product that I was going to tell you about for spot cleaning your oven, right? Instead of getting the aerosol spray where you have to spray the entire oven cavity, and then you've literally got your head buried in an oven to wipe it out, right? If you just have some small stains in the oven, you can get this product. It's called Carbon Off, right? You can buy it either, I think, on the internet or at most restaurant supply um, stores as well. But what this is, is a gelatinous form of oven cleaner. You'll brush it on with a small um, paintbrush, right? Just get an old paintbrush that you never want to use. Don't ever bring it near food. Um, but you brush a little of this on the stain, let it sit for a few hours, preferably overnight, but you can let it just go for a few hours and then come back with a, a rag and wipe it off and it'll take those stains right off your finish. Will not damage the finish on your porcelain, which is the interior of the oven or on your stainless, right? won't hurt your stainless steel, right? You just want to use this for those spot stains. Um, for those of you who might own a Wolf Range or something like that, um, this will also clean some parts of your Wolf Range as well. If you get stains in the, in the pans or on the burners themselves, you can use this to clean that as well. So the carbon off is a great thing to have for those in-between cleaning times when you just don't want to run the cleaning cycle, but you need to get a little stain off your oven floor. So really nice to have. And then the last cleaning product, you know, um, I, I do, this kind of drives me crazy. Um, at the end of the year, you get grease and stains that build up on your oven racks. And anybody who's ever tried to clean an oven rack with a brush or something like that, you know how damaging it can be to your knuckles and how frustrating it is you can't get it clean, right? So this product is called Carbona 2-in-1 Oven Rack and Grill Cleaner. Um, it's really a simple method. You can literally take your oven racks, put them into what is included in the kit, which is a large Ziploc bag, and I mean really big. You put the racks in the Ziploc, you add the entire contents of the bottle of, that comes with the kit into the bag, you shake it a couple of times, let it sit you know, in your garage, on your patio, just somewhere out of the way overnight. The next morning, put it in the sink, just take the sprayer and just spray it off, and all that grease and all that buildup just washes down the drain, and you have racks that are in perfect shape. It actually even cleans out the area where the ball bearing is so you don't lose any functionality to your racks. It works like a charm and it will save you, like I said, it'll save you a lot of time and a lot of hassle and it'll get your racks cleaner than you, I guarantee you, you ever could with a scrubber and some 
pad. So this works really, really well. I do it once a year on my racks and it works out really nicely. They look brand new after a year of that. So, um, so let's um, segue a little bit over to our sub-zero. Oh, you have a question from the oven? Uh-huh. And fire fevers, those are all good to use on the interior if you need to just do a little scratch. Absolutely. So neither one of these cleansers will scratch your appliance, right? So long as you're just using the blue scotch Bright pad to clean the interior of your oven, you don't run a risk of scratching anything. I will tell you, the Bon Ami is a little less abrasive than the barkeeper's friend, but I've never scratched any of it thing that I um, have cleaned with the barkeeper's friend. Bon Ami is just a little bit gentler. That's it. The nice thing about barkeeper's friend is it'll get stains off the bottom of your pots and pans as well, um, where this is not quite abrasive enough in some cases for that, but this is super gentle. Um, if someone ran the self-clean with their racks in, uh -huh. it's not going to necessarily ruin them. You no. just, just don't make it a habit. Yeah, try not to make it a habit. Most important thing to do, what you notice sometimes if that does happen to you and you've run the self-cleaning feature with the racks in place, right? You may notice that when you try to like pull the rack out, it feels like it's kind of sticking, like it's gritty, like there's something like catching on the sides, right? That's just from the self-cleaning impacting the stainless steel and the finish on your racks. So it's a very easy fix. Um, go to the, the home improvement store and grab yourself the finest grit sandpaper you can find. 2000 grit, 3000 grit, really, really fine. Not abrasive at all. Take that sandpaper and just gently sand the rails on the side racks, not the big racks, but on the side racks, just gently sand those like a few times just to get them smooth again. And you'll find that the, the action of your racks will go back to its old form, right? So you just want to get those kind of sanded down a little bit on the side racks and that'll make it slide a little bit more easily, right? Um, and that's, that's the best way to do it if you mistakenly run the, the cleaning cycle with, um, with the racks in place. And I, I didn't mention this at the beginning, but I want to make sure that I reiterate it. And you guys have probably all heard this before is, Nothing goes on the floor of your oven to protect it, to clean it. No, no foil, no silicon mats, right? As we talked a little bit before, maybe a pan of water to, to kind of, you know, give a little um, steam and moisture when we're baking bread, but nothing goes on the floor of the oven. Because again, as you now have learned, when I have 90% of my energy coming from that baking element underneath, it's going to cook that foil. It's going to cook that stain, uh, that, uh, that silicone, it can actually almost cook it to the floor of your oven. And A, it's not covered by the warranty. And B, um, it just looks like heck. So you wanna make sure that you don't put anything on the floor in order to just preserve the look of the oven, right? It just doesn't look good. And, you know, so tell your well-meaning relatives and, you know, people who come in and say, oh, I'm gonna do them a favor. I'm gonna put foil on the floor of their oven. And then you turn the oven on, next thing you know, it's, that's, a, that's something that's for life of the oven. You're never gonna get it off, so. Do you have another question, Lynn? Um, there was one more regarding the oven. Sure. Um, so we're talking about sweet potato. Uh huh. Um, what's the reason to use like the gourmet sweet potato over over just like baking sweet potato? If the if your method for baking a sweet potato works perfectly well for you, then there's no reason to use the gourmet. The gourmet feature is really there for folks who maybe just don't, don't have a method or need a, a better way to cook it. It's not gonna say that the gourmet with it is the best way to cook it. It's just that what the chefs at Wolf discovered was a really good way to cook it. So will it work? Absolutely, but if your way works perfectly, there's no reason to change. So that's what I would say, okay? So let's talk a little bit about, you know, taking care of your sub-zero refrigerators. Um, what we have here is a classic, style, uh, side by side, 42 inch sub-zero. Um, and so we wanna just talk a little bit about the features and the maintenance and what you're gonna need to do to take care of your sub-zero. Fortunately, they're a fairly low maintenance appliance. You, there's not a lot you have to do with it, sort of, short of kind of cleaning it out periodically. Um, but again, let's just kind of go through some of those steps in case anybody has any other questions. So obviously side by side refrigerator and freezer. So obviously, um, 
moving the shelves are obviously pretty easy. They're just gonna lift in and out on these little glides so you can reposition to wherever you need um, in there. Um, so that's, and those can obviously just be washed in the sink. I would recommend not putting them in the dishwasher. Um, just put them, you know, just wash them in the sink with warm soapy water is gonna be the best way to maintain the look of your shelving units. Same thing is true here with what we like to call the butter penthouse here at the top where we keep all of our dairy products up there. Um, and then with your, the removal of your drawers, your high humidity drawers, your, your, your top drawer, which is sort of like your, your deli meats and your cheeses, a great place for putting in that top drawer. But in these, they just slide out literally and they just make sure they just pop up and out and then you just slide it out. Um, so then these can easily just be washed into the, in the sink. And remember too, if you wanna remove that center section, they, they only go in a certain way um, with these two little uh, grooves in the back that just kind of fit into those, they just fit over the little half moon shaped and then they slide down and in. So they're like that. And then you're just gonna wanna align this on those two rails. Um, easiest way to do that is just, Pull, make sure they're fully extended. It's a little easier, but you wanna make sure that you feel it click in at the front, which it will do like that. And then it's, and you'll always know it's shutting properly because it's like a soft closed drawer. As it pulls in, it should naturally close and pull itself closed all the time um, when we're doing that. And then obviously knowing that your shelves are easily rearranged just by lifting up at the front and then moving them down however you need to configure them um, as you would like. And the same thing is gonna be true with your freezer shelves as well and the freezer baskets in, your, in this side. It's gonna come out exactly the same way, okay? So remember too that in all of your Sub-Zero refrigerators, you're going to find not only your, your manual, which basically describes all the, um, the different temperature zones and storage zones ideally suited in your refrigerator, but it also gives you a key to all the guides that are going to show up here in the LED screen. So when you're setting for the ice maker or you need to change a filter or anything like that, all those messages are gonna to come to you in the form of symbols that are gonna show up in this screen. And those are all just listed right here so that you know what you're reading when they do show up up there, right? Um, and then in the other side of that same um, card is going to be ideal storage areas on um, throughout the Sub-Zero so that you know exactly what the best place for storing things is going to be in your oven, and excuse me, in your refrigerator, and then what, um, how to move things and, and insert and change things as well. But my favorite card obviously is your food freshness card, which comes with this, um, and it obviously breaks down the food not only by um, uh, sort of product type, so it's produce, it's dairy, it's, it's fresh meats and cheeses, things like that, but it also tells you what is ethylene sensitive and what is producing ethylene gas, right? And uh, so you know that it's probably not a good idea to stick something that's ethylene negative with something that's ethylene positive because they're not gonna get along so well. Um, so you wanna just make sure that you're kind of keeping mindful of those with your produce and maybe dividing your drawers, you know, accordingly so you're not putting those two things together in the, in the refrigerator. But again, also these are color keyed, so you know that um, the green corresponds to the green section on the little map of the refrigerator above, above, as does the blue and the different purple and violet sections there as well. So always good to kind of familiarize yourself with these. Nice that they're there in the refrigerator at all times, right? So maintenance wise on your Sub-Zero, pretty straightforward. Um, if you have an ice maker or an internal or external water dispenser, you're gonna be able to, you're gonna to have to change your water filter. Um, so depending on the unit that you have, um, your water filter on a classic design is always gonna be above and it's very easily removed by just gripping the water filter near the end, twisting a quarter turn and then removing the filter. Thusly, um, you can always get these filters through us here at Roth or if you need Great, great Plains appliance, uh, 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 parts up in Golden can also get these for you. And obviously you can find them on the internet. Um, and usually you can just um, type in your model number and it'll tell you which filter is appropriate for your refrigerator. And again, it's just reinserted the same way. Go in and it's a quarter turn in the opposite direction to re-engage your filter, right? And the 
filter, if it needs to be replaced, that symbol will show here in your panel. So you'll never, you'll, you'll know um, how often you need to replace your filter. It's really going to depend on your usage, whether you use a lot of ice or you drink a lot of filtered water out of your dispenser, the filters will last a little bit shorter amount of time, right? Um, the other filter that'll need to be replaced on a consistent basis is going to be your air filter. That's going to be in the door in the back of the refrigerator section of your refrigerator. You're going to want to lift up that front panel and then you'll see it says pull to eject. You'll pull that forward and then just lift out the filter. Um, these are going to be replaced probably at the most, maybe once a year, um, maybe a little more frequently, but it's doubtful. So you're going to replace these once a year. Um, with a new filter. Um, again, it will tell you when the air filter needs to be replaced. Um, but then again, this will help keep the mold, the bacteria, the mildew, um, uh, the viruses and the odors um, eliminated from the air inside the refrigerated section of your unit. So when you want to replace it, it's very simple. You literally just place it back in, push down, push that forward to engage it and turn it off. It's automatically turned on as long as it's activated here. Um, you can see here, it'll say um, pure air. So if you decide that you don't want to use the filter, you can turn it off um, and that will turn it on or off. So it's engaged during the, during the operation of your refrigerator. The only other thing you're going to need to do to maintenance is probably on an annual basis, you're going to want to open on your classic model, the panel here. And just here on this side, you'll see the condenser coils for your refrigerator. Just get a soft bristled brush, it can be an old paintbrush, something like that, and then just brush in a downward or upward motion, but don't go side to side, just go up or down to just brush out any dust and dirt that might accumulate on that condenser. Um, it's just gonna help your refrigerator perform um, at its optimum. Um, it'll extend the life of the refrigerator and just keep your, your food um, nice and fresh and cold all the time. So just once a year or so, you know, just make sure you're, you're brushing that forward. If you have a designer model where your, your um, operation uh, mechanics are on the bottom, you'll need to remove the kick plate. And then there's two screws that attach the, another plate behind it. You'll just remove those and you'll see the condenser coils there. And you'll just do the same thing and brush them off. And that's really all you'll need to do to maintain your, your appliance. And for those people who are really interested, um, the, so, the Sub-Zero Owners app, right, is available to connect your Sub-Zero appliances and your wall ovens. You can do that to your phone. There's some nice functionality in there, but the nice, nicest part about it is it will remind you if your kids leave the oven door open or leave the, the refrigerator door open. Um, it'll also tell you if your oven is preheated, if you set it to that. So if you're interested in that and you want a connected appliance, you can um, just search on either um, uh, the um, Google Play or the, uh, the App Store and look for the, the uh, Sub-Zero Owners app, and then you'll allow you to, to do that. So I think, that's pretty much it. Now, questions, Lynn, that we can answer for some folks maybe that have come in? Um, yes. A um, couple about the M series. Sure. The list of gourmet mode recipes, um, is it updatable through like a thumb drive, like call for service, and then they can update it? I, they, will, they can update your M series operating system. Yes, it can be updated. Um, it requires a manual connection to your oven. So you'll need to call for service or if you do get service at any time on any of your Sub-Zero Wolf appliances, they can update it while they're there to do that. So um, should you ever need um, service on any of your appliances, um, I would recommend that you have them just check your um, M or E series oven so they can make sure they can operate that, update that operating system as well. Okay. And we have a CSO over the M series. After about a year, the M series control panel shorted out. Uh -huh. Any way you can prevent that? I think that that. Hmm. Maybe now was we don't know what caused the the M series panel to short. We don't we don't know if it was the CSO. It would be unlikely that it was the CSO. Right. So pretty it's pretty standard uh, design uh, pairing. So I don't know what would have caused that. Um, uh, 
the only thing I, you might be cognizant of, and it may, may have caused it, it, was that if you're running both ovens at extremely high temperatures simultaneously, that may cause a fair amount of heat buildup inside the panel of the M series because the CSO is on top of it. So it's, um, it could only be that some, if you're running a CSO at a maximum temperature and an M series at a maximum temperature that you might run into a problem just like that. So that may be something to, uh, to consider. All right, I'm gonna give a call for any more questions and then we'll sign off in just a second here. Anything else? So to next week, if you are interested and you do own um, one of our, um, our either, maybe you own a dual fuel range as well, or one of our, our standalone sort of SRTs, our, our, uh, our range tops or uh, cooktops and things like that, and you want some information on those, um, we will be hosting this uh, very similar event to today, um, talking about those particular set of appliances uh, next Monday at about this same time. So if you are interested, um, definitely reach out to us and we can get you signed up for that as well. Um, if you find that that will be beneficial to you um, in terms of your ownership of, of the appliances. We will, again, uh, send out an email with this uh, document attached to it so you can all have a copy of that so you can see the different um, percentages of energy that are coming from the different cooking modes. Um, and I wanna thank everybody for joining us today. I hope you found this um, uh, uh, instructive and in educational in any ways. And, uh, if, you, if you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out not only to myself, but obviously any of our showroom consultants here can help you as well with any other questions. So thank you so much.